Our guest today spots educational trends as they are just beginning to emerge. When the school shutdowns occurred in the spring of 2020, Joseph Connor was ready. He was already working on co-founding Schoolhouse or GetSchoolhouse.com, which was a microschool enabler that would connect parents, learners, and educators. When pandemic pods became a household phrase in the summer and fall of 2020, Get Schoolhouse took off, raising more than $8 million in venture capital funding. In 2021, Joe moved on from co-founding Get Schoolhouse to his current startup, Odyssey. Uh, Just as he spotted early interest in pods and microschools, he also saw the growing support for school choice policies. 2021 was coined the year of school choice and many states introduced or expanded policies that would enable education funding to follow students instead of going directly to school systems. And this year, we've seen a lot of those school choice policies that were passed legislatively in 2021 now get implemented this year so that families have real choices. Joe founded Odyssey to help connect families to the available education choice programs that are now available uh, in their respective states, ensuring that all eligible families are able to access these choice programs. Joseph Connor, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you, Carrie, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here. Uh, Always excited to hear your perspective on education and especially on education entrepreneurship. Uh, Let's start with your background. You know, early in your career, you were involved in education as a charter school teacher. Then you went to law school and became more interested in education policy and entrepreneurship as a practicing attorney. Ultimately, you made the leap into education entrepreneurship. So can you tell us a bit more about your career path and what ultimately brought you to this point as a startup founder? Absolutely. So my entire career, I think, has been spent on trying to figure out how we can implement policies and help create schools that help all students in the U.S. receive a great education. Um, So you mentioned I started as a teacher. teaching at the KIPP and Rocket Ship Education Charter School Networks. Uh, I had a class of 30, and my focus was solely on trying to get those kids um, up to and beyond grade level. Uh, It was a very humbling experience, as I think most teachers find it. Um, It took about a year or two until I felt like I knew what I was doing. Um, But I really saw in that job the effect that a single person can have on a group of kids. Um, And so that, I think, is something that's kind of remained with me. Um, And then after teaching, I moved into uh, working as an attorney. And so I continued to fight for uh, education policies that I thought benefited kids in the courtroom. We actually had an exciting um, case. We were working on the Espinoza matter, which was a large Supreme Court case regarding school choice. Uh, We were able to file a brief there on behalf of the Institute for Justice, which was very exciting. Um, And after that, I had at that point spent a couple of years then in policy and was really itching to get back into actually operating. And so that's when I started Schoolhouse. um, And we were able to open up a number of schools uh, because there was such huge demand during the pandemic for high quality in-person options. Um, And so I've really, I think, discovered a passion in myself for education entrepreneurship. And really at Odyssey, I think one of our goals is to be able to provide support to those education entrepreneurs out there, the folks who are starting micro schools, who are starting um, tutoring centers, um, who are doing learning pods, and really making sure that they can get um, financial assistance uh, from parents who are on some of these programs that we help run. Yeah, so I want to get into more detail on what Odyssey is doing and some of the exciting things you have going on this fall um, with that startup. But but first with, with, with Schoolhouse, you know, you had your finger on the pulse of this kind of micro school pandemic pod movement um, back in the beginning of the pandemic. And even before that, when you were sort of thinking about more of these innovative options, what has your sense been over the past couple of years? Um, you know, could you have imagined in the fall the spring of 2020 that we'd be here in terms of the growth of the micro school movement and some of these learning options? 
Uh, I think the short answer is no. I've been blown away, I think, by how much demand there is out there from parents and how many great schools are being opened up in all 50 states. So I think I had an early seat at the micro school table because of some interesting work and people that I knew. Uh, so just to name two, one is um, I knew Kelly at Prenda uh, rather kind of early on. And so was able to follow his success and see what he achieved in Arizona. And even before then, I actually worked um, for an interesting company called Alt School, ALT School, um, that had originally an idea of opening up a micro school network. And so my was my first job actually as an attorney. I did deep dives and research into regulations in all 50 states and top 20 major cities on, hey, how could you open up a micro school network quickly such that you don't have to go through all of the regulations that often hold up charters and private schools if they need zoning variances or they you know, need uh, to abide by other regulations. So that really, I think, got me focused very early on on micro schools. And I would say the most exciting thing about the micro school movement is as someone who's been in education for 14 years, this is truly the first movement that is powered by parents. And what I mean by that is that, yes, there are national networks. We mentioned Prenda, Schoolhouse, there's Kaipod, um, but the vast majority of these micro schools are being set up by teachers, are being set up by parents or guardians, um, by, are being set up by community leaders. And so there is kind of, I think, this vibrancy that comes from people who are really uh, situated in their communities, know exactly what they need, and are able to set up uh, a school that kind of reflects that, which I think is incredibly exciting and frankly, very different from some of the other places I've worked at, such as the charter sector, right, where it's a much more kind of top down approach. Uh, so that's probably been the most exciting thing that I've seen. Yeah. And so, you know, you started with Schoolhouse really focusing on these uh, pods, parent led pods and the micro school movement, and then realized it was much bigger than that, right? This movement goes even beyond just micro schools to kind of expanding the ecosystem of available education options for families and the tie in to school choice policies, uh, which of course have dramatically expanded over the past couple of years. Now we have a universal education savings account program in Arizona that got passed earlier this year or enacted earlier this year that enables every child in Arizona to have access to about 90% of the per pupil state funding, which is around $6,500 per student uh, to use on available uh, education options and approved educational expenses like micro schools, learning pods, tutoring, educational therapies, homeschooling and supplies and so on. And West Virginia is right behind Arizona uh, in passing a nearly universal education mm -hmm. savings account as well. So you saw this trend toward bringing um, micro schools and other kinds of non-traditional education options into the sort of school choice movement and connecting the two, um, which I imagine is how Odyssey came to be. Tell us a little bit about that origin story. Absolutely. Um, so when we were at Schoolhouse, we had expanded to 10 states and we had dozens of schools. And one of the things that we started looking into to kind of continue to grow was, hey, are there public funds available such that parents don't necessarily have to pay out of pocket? So I started really um, researching education savings accounts, micro grant programs, other programs at the state level. And what I found was that there was a big difference between the way that people kind of talk about how these programs work and the actual implementation. And so in a few states where we tried to access the funds, we ran into issues. Um, some of those issues were the platforms had data breaches, uh, parents, it, it took parents days or weeks or even months to hear back. A lot of the administrative burden was on parents. Um, for example, in Arizona, they had all of these different classifications and some of them were for military families. Military families actually had to get a letter from a military commander on the base in order to access these funds. So from a user perspective, they were not very well designed and it was really hard for parents to access them. And so this led to us considering, hey, is this something that we should build at Schoolhouse? And ultimately decided, you know what, this is actually its own separate entity. 
So left Schoolhouse with the idea of starting Odyssey to really democratize Americans access to high quality education. And so Odyssey allows parents to easily apply for and get approved for ESA and microgrant programs. And then they're able to actually take those funds, funds from the state and buy goods and services from high quality vendors, either locally or online. And so one of the most important things for me when we were designing it was designing it with the end user in mind. So we ended up talking to hundreds of parents in places like Arizona and Florida, um, New Hampshire, uh, some of the families in, in West Virginia we talked to, to really understand, okay, what's important to you in a platform? And then we designed it uh, with kind of great team members from companies like Lyft and AngelList and Google with the customer in mind. And so right now our platform can take a parent from application um, to verification in as little as four minutes, um, which is kind of a, a huge sea change in uh, the way we process these. And that's been reflected, I think, in the demand for some of the programs in our early pilot state. Well, it's great to see so much demand from parents for these school choice options and for these innovative learning models um, that are continuously sprouting. And, and certainly there is this link between school choice policies and educational entrepreneurship. I've uh, spent sev several days in South Florida in the kind of greater Fort Lauderdale area meeting with education entrepreneurs there and have had several mm -hmm. on the podcast um, who, you know, will say that school choice policies definitely accelerated their programs um, and made them certainly more accessible to more families because now children are able to attend uh, either at little to no cost through the state's tax credit scholarship programs. Uh, and so then it encourages more educators and more parents to launch similar programs. I wonder what you're seeing uh, with Odyssey, you know, in terms of the this activation of supply of innovative yeah. education options and how Odyssey facilitates that? It's a great question. I think a lot of school choice focuses on the benefit to parents and rightfully so, but I think a um, perspective that is not talked about as much is what you bring up, which is what about the supply side? What are the high quality options that are appearing? And what I think we've seen in states that have passed universal or near universal is that nonprofits, and companies and organizations take notice of that. And so, for example, you mentioned Arizona, they passed a expansion of their current ESA. It's now universal, which means all 1.1 million students qualify. Um, Odyssey has had very interesting conversations with vendors who are considering expanding to Arizona. I just had a conversation a couple of days ago with someone who runs a private school in a different um, state, and he had actually decided in the space of a few days uh, to move all of their future marketing and enrollment from that state to Arizona because he was so excited about the opportunity that's there. Um, you're seeing increasingly new micro schools spring up. Uh, a really cool option uh, that you may have heard about in Arizona is Adamo Education. Um, which I think right now has two micro schools open and is looking to open up more. But those are homegrown micro schools started by people in the state. And so I think that one of the really exciting things is in five to 10 years, when more programs have been passed, existing programs have improved their capacity, the number of high quality suppliers, I think will be much larger than it is in many of these places. And so that's something that's very exciting for us. And so we work very closely with vendors, making sure they're aware of these opportunities. And I think Florida has a lot of great opportunities as well as Arizona, and hopefully we get more states in that column soon. Yeah, so you're really operating at this intersection between education entrepreneurship and school choice policies and, and recognizing the ways in which those are related and that they kind of play off of each other. And investors are noticing uh, this kind of special 
uh, advantage that you bring to the table. And in fact, you recently announced a new venture capital seed round of $4.7 million from the premier venture capital firm and Dreesen Horowitz um, that's excited to invest in that. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about them and, and the fund specifically that they're using to uh, help support your work. Absolutely. Um, we're very excited that Andreessen has invested $4.75 million in us. Specifically, they're investing out of their American dynamism practice, uh, which is a portfolio that focuses on founders and companies trying to solve what they consider important national problems. So uh, education is one, healthcare is another, construction, uh, national defense. And the idea is that increasingly we as Americans need to invest in and make sure we have high quality options in order to improve the lives of citizens throughout the country. And so this falls neatly within that because our company Odyssey is really able both to help parents and states, uh, parents to navigate these programs, states to administer them, but also I think importantly is able to kind of create a great ecosystem of education entrepreneurs in the states we operate because we're able to take that government funding and make sure that it goes to high quality operators. Um, and so that's very exciting um, and something that we're, we're kind of really um, uh, thrilled about to be able to have their backing and their support as we continue to grow and improve the product. So exciting. And, you know, I think one of the things that makes it really difficult in the education sector to be an entrepreneur is that it's such a highly regulated sector with so many barriers to entry and scale. Mm -hmm. Um, for these educational entrepreneurs, especially for these small micro school founders and people who are just trying to run tutoring programs and those sorts of things. What have you found to be some of the, the key barriers or obstacles for these yeah. entrepreneurs? It, it's a great question. And I think one that, that we've talked about previously. As an attorney, I think I had very clear ideas of where we run into obstacles. Surprisingly, I think the number one obstacle we found when we were opening up new schools and what I typically hear from other micro school founders is that zoning is usually the biggest blocker to new schools. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of, I think, talk made at the federal and state level about maybe increased regulations of learning pods and micro schools with a few exceptions. Those generally don't pass. Um, what we see is that the kind of most involved regulatory body is usually just the zoning board. And so in America, we have very strict zoning codes, especially in suburban cities. And residential is usually its own separate zoning code. Um, schools can often be their own code. And so what that means is if a micro school is springing up, and oftentimes micro schools are run very lean uh, in the first year or first couple of months, so they often might start in, say, a home or someone's garage. Um, I know ones that start, you know, in community centers at churches or synagogues. Um, I know someone who started one in a bar in Brooklyn. Um, usually what happens is they start, they get some traction, and then uh, they run into an obstacle if a neighbor complains, right? And so we actually have had to deal with that um, ourselves at Schoolhouse, where we ran into zoning issues in the New York suburbs. Um, I know other networks and schools that have had that same issue actually in South Florida and in Arizona. And so I think from the perspective of policymakers and politicians and regulators, for people to be able to encourage more micro school founders, I think we need to take a very close look at the zoning code. Um, and that mainly is a local issue, which means it kind of has to happen municipality by municipality. But really, I think the zoning code was written with the idea of, okay, a school is going to be 500 to 1,000 kids, and therefore, every time a school gets built, we need to do you know, an environmental study and a traffic mitigation study. But I think one of the things of micro schools is you know, they don't fall neatly into our traditional school model. And so that means that, well, look, if we're going to open up a school with 20, 30 people, it probably doesn't need to have um, some type of parking minimum or it doesn't need to actually fall into a certain style of the zoning code. So I think what I'm seeing increasingly is that zoning is the biggest blocker. And I would love to see a lot of states and cities actually kind of tackle that preemptively uh, in order to encourage schools to continue to grow. 
Yeah. Zoning is a huge issue. It's definitely yeah. one of the biggest headaches that I hear from education entrepreneurs, especially those who are creating these emerging learning models. And I think you're absolutely right that, that, that zoning codes are often uh, focused around this outdated version of what a school is that doesn't take into consideration micro schools and other innovative models um, that were just not even uh, sort of a thing or, you know, a movement at the time that these codes were written. And it's really preventing a lot of entrepreneurs from expanding into new cities or starting in the first place. So, you know, I wonder what your advice would be to education entrepreneurs, whether it would be someone who just wants to create a micro school to serve maybe their children or the children in their community, or even someone who wants to create a more of a venture capital backed startup like Odyssey, uh, do you have different advice, similar advice? You know, what would you say to these aspiring entrepreneurs? I think it's similar advice. I think my advice is simple. It's get started. I think there's a lot of reasons not to get started. People worry about regulation. They worry about will they be able to, you know, fill the enrollment. Um, they want to, you know, design the school down to the nth degree. But what I've seen in my experience is teachers and parents who start with something move much quicker than someone who is kind of planning for years on end. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you're wanting to start a school, I think the best way to do that is to start maybe a summer camp or start an after school program, right? Start trying to figure out what it is that you want to provide, what it is that parents and families are looking for in your local community, um, and then go from there. I think a lot of the most successful models follow that, where they really start because they see a demand from parents in their community for something different. They start providing it probably at kind of the smallest possible unit, right? So it's an after-school program a few days a week. It's a summer camp that runs for a week. And then they go from there and they build demand. And then when they're actually ready to open up the school, they have kind of a ready population of people who, you know, believe and trust that they have the ability to run a good school. And so that is kind of a virtuous cycle that I've seen that I think works well for a lot of education entrepreneurs and micro school founders, which is, you know, don't kind of uh, spend too much time analyzing and trying to figure everything out. I think start small and then grow from there and kind of improve the model over time. And I think those have been some of the most successful ones that I've seen. So Joe, you have a baby at home and I wonder if you think about uh, the kind of future of education uh, as your child grows, you know, what do you see education looking like over the next five to 10 years? Yeah. So I think what I am very excited about is really a rise in alternative education. Um, you know, Carrie, you'll have to excuse me. You've probably heard all of these stats that I've cited before, but increasingly, parents are choosing alternative forms of education, right? We've seen rise in homeschool numbers. Uh, charter schools have continued to grow year over year. They just had one of their biggest years where they added uh, nearly a quarter of a million people. Uh, micro schools and learning pods appear to be an entirely new sector. And so what I really want for my daughter is that she has the ability to customize her education and do really cool and different types of stuff. And so that means that, you know, if she wants to be able to go to a Montessori school for three days a week, and then we're homeschooling her for two days, we have that option. Um, if she wants to be able to, you know, take her money and we're able to, you know, go to a forest school or maybe a Waldorf school, we can do that. We can do a homeschool co-op. I think my biggest wish is for her and for, all kids is just to be able to really customize their school in a way that reflects the family's desires and values. And I think in many places in the country, we still unfortunately don't have that. And so that's kind of the mission of Odyssey and what we're working towards, which is really democratizing that access to high quality education options, including alternative models that I think for many parents um, have been out of reach if they've had to pay out of pocket. This is beginning to kind of reverse that, which I think is very exciting. 
It is so exciting just to see now that parents do have so many more options in education, just as they have in other areas of their lives and education's finally catching up. They can customize and curate an education for their child that fits their child's unique needs and interests and that reflects their sort of family preferences and values. And it's exciting to see where this goes and that, that companies like Odyssey are helping to facilitate uh, that emergence of so many of these options. So Joe, what is the best way for my listeners to find out more about Odyssey? Absolutely. Uh, you can check us out at um, or on Twitter at with Odyssey underscore. You can also follow me on Twitter at Joseph J. Connor. Um, you can reach out directly to me. My email address is joe at with Odyssey.com. And then our website is www.withodyssey.com. Well, best wishes for the future of Odyssey and for your work in helping to expand education options for families. Joseph Connor, thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you so much for having me.